Chapter 8 Over the Wall A surprise! Nancy exclaimed. How could that keep those men from following me? Her father smiled. Can't you guess? Nancy's eyes suddenly sparkled. Oh, I think I know. Dad, you didn't! It isn't! The lawyer laughed. I did, and it is. Your new convertible is at Packlin Motors. I was going to surprise you with it next week, but I'll have Mr. French bring the car around as soon as it's dark outside. Oh, Dad, how wonderful, said Nancy, hugging him. You're the most generous father. After a pause, she added, Those men will be on the lookout for me in my old car, and I'll be spinning off in a shiny new one. Then Nancy became serious. I must leave here without their seeing me. You could have Mr. French bring the new car to the street behind our house. I'll sneak out the back way. That's what I thought, said Mr. Drew. While he called Packlin Motors, Nancy hurried upstairs and told Hannah the news, then packed a suitcase for her visit at Sylvan Lake. After dinner, she called the Cornings to say she would be there later in the evening. Helen's grandmother was delighted. At nine o'clock, both the doorbell and the telephone rang at once. As Mr. Drew headed for the door, Nancy picked up the phone. Bess was calling to say that the cousins would meet her at the lake the next day. Mother will drive us out. Sorry we can't leave now. That's okay. When Nancy entered the living room, a muscular young man was talking to her father. She recognized him as Henry Durkin, superintendent of the building where Mr. Drew had his law office. Henry's going to help us, Nancy, her father explained, as she walked into the room. I called him while you were packing. Hannah can stay with her sister while you're away. Henry will drive her and Effie there after we've gone. Are you coming with me, Dad? Nancy asked, surprised. I certainly am, he said firmly. I'm taking no chances on your being alone if those men pick up your trail. After Henry takes Hannah and Effie, he will drive my car to the Cornings, pick me up, and take me to the airport. I have a conference in Chicago tomorrow and a reservation on the midnight plane. Henry Durkin frowned. Mr. Drew, if I were you, I'd call the cops. That'll be your job as soon as Nancy and I leave the house, the lawyer said. I don't want those men in the car disturbed until then. As long as they're parked on this street, we know where they are. Nancy, he added, as soon as I reach the airport, I'll call Lieutenant Mulligan and tell him about the Tooker estate. Now we must hurry. While Henry Durkin brought Nancy's bag downstairs, she rummaged in the back of her closet and found an old suitcase. She carried it to the hall below where her father was waiting. I have an idea, Dad. Suppose I take my old car out of the garage and park it at the curb. If Mr. Durkin carries this suitcase out and puts it in the luggage compartment, the men in the sedan will surely think I'm leaving in that car. Good, said Mr. Drew. He switched on the porch light. We'll make the front of the house as conspicuous as possible. And meanwhile, Nancy said with a smile, we'll slip out the back door. When her car was in place, she gave the empty bag to Henry. Carry that as if it's full and heavy, she said with a chuckle. As he went out the door, Nancy stepped out onto the porch and called loudly and clearly. Thanks a lot, Henry. Put it in the back. Then she went inside and followed her father to the unlighted kitchen. He was carrying her bag and his own. Together, they stepped outdoors and peered into the darkness. They wondered uneasily if there were any unseen watchers. Quietly, they felt their way toward the rear of the garden. Nancy was first to reach the high brick wall. With the help of the tough vines growing over it, she pulled herself to the top. Hand up the bags, she whispered. Mr. Drew did so and began to climb the wall. 
By now, Nancy's eyes had become accustomed to the darkness, and suddenly she saw a figure detach itself from the shadow of the garage and disappear down the driveway. Dad, she whispered, someone was watching. We must move fast then, he said, and dropped the bags to the ground in the adjoining backyard. Nancy leaped down, landing lightly a moment before her father. Mr. Drew grabbed the suitcases and they sped through the neighbor's yard, then down the driveway to the sidewalk. At the curb stood a beautiful convertible, its polished metal reflecting light from the street lamp several houses away. Despite their desperate hurry, Nancy felt a thrill of excitement. My new car, she whispered. As she reached it, a figure stepped from the shadows and her heart pounded. But a second later, she relaxed. Here are the keys, Mr. Drew, said a deep voice. Mr. French, exclaimed the lawyer as he tossed the two bags into the back seat. Many thanks. Sorry we're in such a rush. Nancy's old car is in front of our house. The keys are inside. Will you pick it up? Nancy can come tomorrow and change license plates. How beautiful this is, Nancy said. She slipped into the driver's seat and turned on the ignition. A deep purr came from the motor. At the same time, the young sleuth glanced into the rearview mirror and saw headlights sweep around the corner. I think they're coming, she said. The next instant, her car was zipping forward. Nancy turned the corner and several more after that. Then she slid into a driveway and switched off the lights. A moment later, the black sedan raced down the street and disappeared in the distance. Its license plate was dangling, so she could not read the number. As Nancy gave a long sigh, Mr. Drew patted her hand. You certainly used your head that time. Thanks, Dad. She enjoyed the drive to the lake, sensing the power of the new car. Finally, she said, I loved my old car, Dad. It did a good job for me, but this one is just marvelous. Glad you're pleased, Nancy. You certainly handle it like a pro. At the lake, the Cornings welcomed the Drews cordially. Over cool drinks, the elderly couple reported that the houseman had not returned, nor had the circle of blue fire been seen that evening. We're still worried, their hostess said. Mr. Drew, it's kind of you to lend Nancy to us. He grinned appreciatively at the implied compliment. Presently, Henry Durkin arrived. Mr. Drew quickly said goodnight to the Cornings, kissed Nancy, cautioned her to be very careful, and left for the airport. Shortly afterward, Mrs. Corning went with Nancy to the room with twin beds that she had occupied the night before. Would you like your friends to be in here with you, Nancy? It would be nice. Then we'll put in a cot tomorrow morning. As Nancy unpacked, her thoughts turned to the missing servant. Since the fiery circle had not appeared after he vanished, possibly it had been a signal to Morgan to leave. But why? Did he go willingly? Nancy wondered. She hoped the next day would bring news of him, but there was no letter in the morning mail, nor a phone call. Nancy was inclined to think he had not left of his own volition, but had been forced to go. Mrs. Corning looked through her letters. I have one from Brent's department store, she said. A dress I ordered has come in. I'd like to pick it up. Nancy quickly volunteered to take her to River Heights. I must turn in the dealer's plates on my car and get my own, she said. Also, I have an errand at the jeweler's. Helen's grandmother accepted the ride. While she was in Brent's, Nancy went to see if Mr. Stone had learned anything about the crest on the gold bracelet. I was going to call you, the jeweler said, taking her into his office. I heard from Abelard de Gotha today. Mr. Stone handed Nancy a typewritten letter. Read this. Dear Mr. Stone, the armorial bearings described in your letter are those of the Eldridge family, 
the crest dating back to Henry IV of England, and the quartering on the shield marking the union of the Eldritch House with the Garretts in 1604. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase, the New York branch of the family, consisting of Isaiah Eldridge, his wife Prudence, and two children, received a large grant of land in what is now Missouri. I presume their descendants still live in or near St. Louis, although I have no records to prove that. Sincerely yours, Abelard de Gotha. Does that help you in any way? Mr. Stone asked. Indeed it does, Nancy replied. I'll try to reach any Eldridges in St. Louis. Nancy thanked the jeweler and hurried back to the car. Mrs. Corning joined her a few minutes later. After new plates had been put on the car, Nancy headed for the lake. When they reached it, she went upstairs to leave her purse. As she opened the bedroom door, there was a cry of, Hi! Bess and George rushed across the room and hugged her. Oh, Nancy, I'm so glad to see you, Bess exclaimed. George, with an affectionate grin, added, You'd think we'd been separated for two years instead of two weeks. Bess was blonde, pretty, and somewhat plump. Her cousin George, a brunette with a short haircut and classic features, gave every indication of being a fine athlete. Nancy, I'm just bursting to tell you something, said Bess. No, George protested quickly. You promised not to breathe a word. Bess gave a great sigh. I don't know which is harder, to keep on a diet or keep in a secret. Nancy laughed. How long before you'll tell me? This afternoon, said George. You'll see for yourself. If I don't wither from curiosity first, Nancy said, chuckling. After lunch, Mrs. Corning insisted that the girls sit on the beach to exchange news and take a swim. Though Nancy would have preferred working on the St. Louis lead, she put her plans aside to please her hostess. Presently, the three visitors appeared in swimsuits and beach coats. Nancy's turquoise suit set off her smooth suntan perfectly, while Bess looked attractive in a butter yellow one. George was a trim contrast in sea green. How pretty you all are, their hostess remarked. She led them down a back stairway, through the small utility room next to Morgan's bedroom, and out to the gravel driveway. There's the way to the beach, she said, showing them a footpath which led into the woods. As the three girls started down the path, George asked, Where did you see the blue fire? Nancy pointed across the slope, near that end of the house. I hope I don't see it at all muttered Bess. Before long, they came out on a flat, narrow bit of shoreline a short distance from a dock. A little girl of five was playing on the edge of it, while two women sunned themselves in beach chairs above the waterfront. Marie, called one of the women, be careful. Nancy and her friend sat down on the dock, enjoying the attractive scenery. A circling speedboat roared toward them. The girls realized that it was going to pass very close to the dock. Suddenly, little Marie jumped up to wave. Marie Eldridge, cried the same woman. Come here. Nancy was startled to hear the name Eldridge, but before she could question the child, Marie lost her balance and toppled into the water. The woman screamed and her companion cried out, The boat! It'll hit her! Nancy had already leaped to the end of the dock. Without hesitation, she dived in after the child, directly in the path of the oncoming boat. End of chapter 8